I'm a political scientist. And so I, I want to just pull out a couple different things about how the global goals re represent a pivot in how we think about sustainability, namely sustainability referring to climate, but also conceptions of equality and governance. And the expanded understanding of sustainability has multiple dimensions, as others have mentioned over the last few days. Let me just mention one. The topics or the issues that previously were understood as highly technocratic or apolitical, such as budgets or a health system or transportation, are now viewed in their complexity, um, having many dim dimensions affecting communities. And in part, this broader conception emerged after millions of young people around the world weighed in on the creation of the agenda. But it also stemmed from the role that um, a number of female ambassadors at the UN played during the negotiation period who were from countries that had just emerged from war. And they insisted that issues relating to peaceful, just, and inclusive societies be part of the SDGs or they were not gonna sign on. So sustainability is still about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, but it has gone far beyond its primary reference to the environment. As important, the SDGs are a paradigm shift in how we think about development. And this was brought up in our breakout session. Development happens everywhere and not just in the global south. And reminding people, and of course, um, Mary Claire just brought this up, this is really critical. Um, these paradigm shifts and pivots have implications or they should have an impact on how we teach and write about both sustainability and development, which I'm gonna to return to in a few minutes and which many of you are, are already working on. And I love this idea of a community of practice. We'll tell you a little bit about one that we're trying to start up. Um, I won't speak about how relevant these are for Canada, but for the United States today and for I think universities everywhere, the SDGs are both very timely, but they're in need of a lot more explanation, discussion, translation, and awareness. And I know there's a range of opinion on the relationship of the SDGs to COVID-19, given all the uncertainty of our trajectories. But I wanna associate myself with those who find that the SDGs to be even more of a North Star for the medium and long-term recovery phases uh, than even before the virus stuck. I find this agenda hugely relevant and time sensitive. There's nothing like a global pandemic to lay bare the inequities and inequalities that shape so many communities, but also highlight just how much one planet we are and the importance of gauge, engaging the development of communities everywhere. Um, let me just touch briefly on how communi communities communicate about the SDGs and the voluntary nature of it. Um, as you probably know, all member states are invited to come to the UN to report out in a voluntary way, their voluntary national reviews. Over time though, a lot of us realized that there was a lot of activity happening below the federal level, that lo localities uh, we're playing a really critical role in advancing the SDGs. Uh, in the US in particular, we're very poorly placed to be able to advance this at a federal level, um, but we're seeing a lot of action at, at the city level. I'm also of the school that believes, um, with all due respect to the UN, that the UN has a relatively minor role to play uh, in making progress on the SDGs. And again, the SDGs need to be locally owned. To that end, in 2018, New York City became the first city in the world to voluntarily report their progress, highlighting the critical role of subnational governments, call it a voluntary local review. And since then, a number of cities around the world, some say as many as 200, have signed on to do voluntary local reviews, including the city of Pittsburgh, where Carnegie Mellon University's main campus is. And I'll, I'll return to that in a second. Now, all of you clearly recognize the role that universities have to play in advancing the SDGs. For me, I come to it from the perspective of field building and the need to grow a next generation that is steeped in new approaches to advancing social justice, human rights, and sustainable development. So for me, what's exciting is the possibility of advancing human rights using the 16 plus agenda. Um, and we can talk more about that. 
So in terms of the contours of our uh, CMU sustainability initiative, um, and then addressing our voluntary university review, I think we're all about on the same timeline. Um, as you heard, I served in the Obama administration and I joined CMU in January, 2018. So that spring 2018 seems to be a time when a lot of us are sort of galvanized. Um, I was already working on efforts when I came to CMU to engage youth on the SDGs with an organization called the International Youth Foundation with support from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and we called our effort Cohort 2030. And I can talk more about that in Q&A if people are interested. Throughout 2018, I had the opportunity to have numerous conversations with colleagues at CMU and the city of Pittsburgh, particularly in the mayor's office about the SDGs. And over the year, I found a steadily growing uh, interest and pockets of like-minded colleagues. By about this time last year, um, I was part of a conversation with CMU leadership on what we ought to do uh, about the SDGs and sustainability at CMU. Recognizing that CMU had about two decades of work uh, that had been done, especially around green practices and drawing on the results of pre previous CMU filings to the sustainability tracking and rating system of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. But there was interest in doing more and in approaching sustainability the way that the SDGs promised to do. But we needed a little infrastructure. So last summer, we uh, stood up a small steering committee that reports regularly to the provost, Jim Garrett. It includes the chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, Dr. Dave Dezombach, the vice president of operations at CMU, Steve Gunther, and me. And we meet weekly for about an hour and we're in just about daily contact, sometimes multiple times a day um, by email. We also stood up an advisory council, which meets monthly and consists of about 20 students, staff, and faculty uh, to help us think through issues around the VUR and the secret sauce. We were lucky to be able to hire the person who had conceived of the VLR for New York City, Alexandra Hineker, and she joined us in January. Um, let me just turn more specifically to the work on the VUR today. We announced in late September at a side event to UNGA that we would produce a VUR by September 20. The provost announced a set of commitments to grow awareness of the SDGs across the university, to elevate our engagement with the SDGs, to oversee community engagement leading to the VUR, which I'll return to in a minute, to develop processes to identify opportunities, to advise on strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges related to the SDGs, and to communicate internally and externally on our commitments. Let me just say that having the university leadership support has been a significant enabling factor in this work to date. We need uh, more than Jim, of course, to deliver on the commitments, but his support has been really vital. We're finding that a VUR is both bottom up, but it has some top down elements as well. The VUR should be viewed as a process as much as a product. It's an unprecedented opportunity to raise awareness, elevate our engagement, and communicate internally and externally about what we're doing. It enables us to take stock of how we're advancing the global goals along three specific categories, which uh, are relevant for all universities, our education, our research, and our practice. It's an opportunity to identify bright spots, as well as, as areas where we could use more um, more focus. Now, uh, not surprisingly, our work in 2020 has been primarily focused on both raising awareness that the SDGs exist and finding out where alignment already exists. Um, we come to this with the premise that the majority, the vast majority of our colleagues do not know about the SDGs, but that many are already working on things that align or might be interested in working more um, on the SDGs. So to that end, we approached awareness raising and communication in a number of fairly obvious ways. A web platform, uh, if you Google Carnegie Mellon and Sustainability Initiative, uh, it'll pop up. It includes an email address for folks to send information to us. Um, but it, we also tried to translate the SDGs into actual work that's going on in the real world. So you'll see the icons, but if you tap on the icons, there's a list that came together with uh, through consultation with 
Brookings and um, the Rockefeller Foundation that really highlights a lot of the, the campaigns that are going on around the world. Um, it's not that we're not using the targets, but we wanted to translate them into what's actually happening. Um, what was really helpful to us was fielding a very brief questionnaire uh, that attempted to capture the knowledge, awareness, and practice of colleagues across um, all our campuses. Um, we have locations in Qatar and Rwanda, LA, Washington, DC, um, and a few other places. And again, we began with the premise that people didn't know about this issue. That questionnaire generated 800 names of people who are willing to be contacted again about the SDGs. And then the virus hit and we went remote and we paused for a moment. But by mid-April, um, we started to think about doing something called a 17 rooms exercise, which we conducted between May 2nd and May 15th. Just a brief word about the 17 rooms. I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but this is an exercise or a tool pioneered again by Rockefeller and Bookings that we adapted at CMU. Originally, it's conceived of as an in-person day-long gathering um, which I participated in in 2018 and 2019 in New York. What we did is we, we, we took it on Zoom. We made it a one hour deep dive around each SDG to directly help inform the voluntary university review by surfacing the work that aligns with the SDGs that is already ongoing in terms of courses, capstones or systems projects. We have a lot of experiential learning that goes on research or artistic creation. There's, Carnegie Mellon is known for its work on tech and AI, but there's a whole, the Mellon side is about uh, artistic creation, but also practice. And this issue of convenings and events are, are really uh, critical. It's not only university practice, but practice that you might have with colleagues, just SDSN Canada, for example. Um, Again, to put it simply, this VUR is a gathering of information on what students, faculty, and staff are doing that aligns with the SDGs goals and the targets. It's a process and it's a product. A brief word about our work with the city of Pittsburgh before I throw it back to all of you for a conversation. As I noted, the city of Pittsburgh has committed to a voluntary local review. We as Carnegie Mellon are not doing that for them as was the case, for example, in Bristol in the UK, where the University of Bristol did the, the VLR for Bristol. We, are, we do have something of what I call a Pittsburgh platform that is forming. And I think it could emerge as a best practice, um, having it be place-based. Uh, I can see a Montreal model, a Toronto team, a Halifax hub, um, specifically, this is about a, a city SDG governance ecosystem that ideally includes local NGOs, youth or cohort 2030, the mayor's office and particularly a mayor's office that has already seen the value out of the SDGs, private sector, where existing private local philanthropy and of course university partners. Uh, and in Pittsburgh, the combination of all of that is happening. So it's gonna be exciting to see how it all evolves. Um, just one last thing to note, we have an active planning process with the University of Pittsburgh about creating a community of practice to teach and train on human rights differently using the 16 plus agenda. So it goes to the comments that were made just before we went to my session. I'm very interested in other communities of practice. We see this as an emerging um, common behavior where cities are getting together, mayor's offices, to share learning, uh, what's working, what's not working. And it's that value add that so many see uh, in the SDGs. So I'm gonna stop there. I look forward to learning from you about what's working. I know that there's a lot of, of work about how to align research that's already going on. So thanks for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I might actually uh, invite, um, let me put my video back on. Here we go. Um, I'm going to invite now uh, Matthew Tyson. From, he's the director of the University of Waterloo Sustainability Office and Megan Fulms from the University of Saskatchewan International Research and Partnerships Office. They've been working on uh, collaboration together, looking at best practice uh, on 
reporting on research uh, at a university level. So that maybe we'll, we'll get, we'll have them say a few words as well and then kind of see where all the conversation flows. I'll do a really quick run through of, of Waterloo's experience and maybe Megan can share a very brief on, on um, Saskatchewan's and then synthesize a little bit of the joint kind of exercise that we've been going through. So um, a few years ago, we put together, um, we wanted to see how the SDGs mapped across existing research on campus. And so, um, of course, this was before Times Higher Education or anyone externally had asked for that information. Um, I think Yale and a couple others had done similar exercises historically. And so we did uh, some work with our Office of Research and Sustainability Office um, to go through all of the publicly available faculty research information um, of which Waterloo maintains a fairly good public facing, um, you know, research profiles on, on different um, uh, faculty members for the university and tried to map those across all 17 SDGs based on um, research areas that were of interest, recent publication data that was on there. Um, it, it's not an easy exercise and as we'll chat about in a couple minutes, there's lots of, ours was very a subjective analysis um, given, um, you know, the, the complexity of the SDGs. Um, what we were also looking at was not just the SDG at the kind of thematic level of something like uh, no uh, uh, good health or well-being or um, affordable and clean energy, but as much as possible, we were trying to drill down to the specific targets and indicators within the SDGs to see if the research that was happening um, would actually have a measurable impact in terms of how the UN is actually tracking these. So um, we have that publicly available now as part of our annual sustainability report um, and have recently gone and uh, now worked with our library to track bibliometrics and use a little bit more of an objective keyword search similar to, to Times Higher Ed. Megan, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> All right, so our sustainability tracking initiative launched much later than Waterloo's. Um, we began with the International Blueprint for Action, which is an international uh, university-wide um, initiative to engage internationally in areas such as the SDGs. And so our office has really taken hold of um, communications around the SDGs. We found very similar issues to um, the, the last speaker about awareness. And uh, it's difficult to uh, move engagement forward without knowing what you're doing at home. So we decided to take a more automated approach than Waterloo um, because we didn't have the people power, essentially. It's a, as Matt mentioned, it's a very arduous process to go through and subjectively analyze these things. And so we ended up taking each of our research project application documents and running them through a qualitative analysis software to have natural language processing do a lot of the work for us. So essentially what we did was we took the Elsevier SDG keywords um, from SciVal, and those are the same keyword queries that were used for the Times Higher Education Impact Ranking. So we figured that these keywords were a very good preliminary objective assessment of SDG alignment for any document that we run through the system. And what that gave us was a, sort of a strength of relationship between the SDG as uh, keywords and that research project. And because we kind of been able to map that out, we then went through and did an object or a subjective analysis that was very quick. It took a lot uh, less reading. We weren't reading the entire document, just reading the abstracts and went over and actually confirmed or denied whether alignment was there. And so because these keywords, some of them are quite vague or trite, um, it was necessary to go through and make sure that alignment was accurate. We did want to avoid greenwashing. Um, and our process ended up working. It is fairly robust. And the beautiful thing about it is that it's not perfect, <laughs> but it is iterative. So Matt and I, in working together, kind of decided that the best practice, which we'd like to evolve with a community of best practice through SDSN, is going to be a continuous improvement process. Because as we all know, the SDGs are incredibly complex and you cannot look at them objectively or subjectively in isolation and get a good picture of what's happening without experiencing a ton of type one or type two errors, greenwashing, missing people. And uh, hopefully this can spin off into things like awareness, research facilitation. Uh, the process should be able to be applied to many other units of analysis as well. So we could be looking at uh, curriculum. We could be looking at development work that's occurring with maybe not uh, faculty research program based. So there's a lot of spin off possibilities that Matt and I are excited about. 